been another outbreak of the vocal cord parasites on the base. Several men are dead. It started in the laboratory on the quarantine platform where the radiation leak occurred. I'd only just deployed the security team. I've sent in a rescue team to help, but they haven't returned. Boss, I need you on this. Come back to Mother Base ASAP. Give the order and I'll, I'll go alone. Boss, what are you... There's no need for that. We can't afford to lose anyone else. We have no idea what's going on exactly. in there. Exactly. Anyone still alive's at their breaking point. Last thing we need is another unit storming in. No telling how they'd react. Fine. First off, check how much the infection has spread. Rescue comes next, after we know the situation. When you're ready to move, just use the iDroid. something to look forward to every month. Miller was so funny at this one. <laughs> when is the party this month? Last month was... Oh, I cannot remember. It was... Um... And then I... No, that is not right. But I am an angel of peace. I... I am a student. I'm sorry, Snake. My head hurts. Could you... let me rest? There was something Skullface said. America is made up of many peoples, but those peoples never mix. Quite so. One nation, home to hundreds of different ethnic groups, many of whom stick to their respective living areas, little colonies, not interacting with other groups, going out of their way to avoid one another, their land, organizations, relationships. Thus, the United States of America is no melting pot. It is more of a salad bowl. It is not made up from one people, but for its minorities to function in society, a common ground is needed. Language. 
Even if the country is not one. No, because it's not one. A lingua franca is necessary. English. American hegemonism was born from the illusion that English could unite diverse ethnicities. In taking in people from around the globe, America became a microcosm of it. Now the boundaries between it and the rest of the world have become blurred. However different our neighbors may be, English enables us to create symbiotic relationships with each other. If English can bring unacquainted neighbors together in America, this should hold true for the world. This salad bowl that is the world can also become one. A ruler's greatest wealth is not money or land. It is the number of individuals under his control. Subjects who work, consume, are there to be used as pawns in war. For a capitalist ruler, his people's power becomes his power. You are the same with your diamond dogs. You spin it with your speeches. But what you're doing is bringing as much talent as you can into your little domain. Every person another feather in your cap. Yes. Since ancient times, every civilization's ruler has had the same idea. When people unite under one will, they become stronger than the sum of their parts. And the one will is the ruler's will. And what do rulers use to bring people together? Language. In the Old Testament, it is written that only one language was spoken in Eden. A shared tongue that united all of humanity. Mankind eventually grew aware of its power and harnessed that strength to build a tower to the heavens. The mighty Tower of Babel. This angered God, who splintered the language of man, and the tower was never completed. Languages emerged, and the earth was divided as men went their separate ways. Every age is the same. A ruler's first order of business, after conquering new land, is to force his tongue on its people. Ancient Rome, Napoleon, and now Zero. English is wrecking havoc around the world right now. The British Empire tilled the land with war as its hoe, then began planting the seed that is English. Eventually, American capitalism became the new instrument. To play its game of wealth, you only had to abide by one rule, English. By exploiting people's desires, English has become a leash that people gladly wear around their necks, it would seem. At E. You disappoint me. Have you forgotten my face? Leave me be. <laughs> you won't respond to anyone else, so I figured it must be me you wanted to see. But now you won't even look at me. Have I not suffered enough? Not until you've eased my suffering first. To tell you the truth, old man, I'm in a bit of a bind. It's about your children. Hmm? You know what I mean? The parasites. The ones that infect a man's throat, killing him if he speaks their language. They must not be allowed to multiply. 
<laughs> you are allowed to live only in order to help me. But you don't want to, do you? So why not choose death instead? Because you want to protect the Digne and their land from me. <sighs> That's your purpose, isn't it? Don't lose sight of that now. <sighs> it's in your interest to cooperate. Because if you don't... Madness. The parasites can't detect your people's tongue. So I'll just have to resort to more heavy-handed means. I have the greatest respect for your people. I would rather avoid such a thing, but... We don't always get our way. I was born a tiny moat in a mighty tempest. And until those winds abate, all I can choose is how to act when they blow me this way or that. Tell me, Code Talker, what happens to a man infected with a pair of your parasites? Can they be removed? Can the full-blown symptoms be prevented? It is impossible to remove the parasites alone. They have too close an affinity with humans. Then how do you stop the symptoms from developing? All right. I was hoping for an answer now, but perhaps you just need a little more time. I'll be back soon. I've set up shop, not far from here. We'll be seeing a lot more of each other. If you're close by, then it is almost complete. We're in the final phases. All that's left is to see if I can actually disable a nuke. With the help of your metallic Archaea. Once that's done, I won't have to return here again. And your suffering will end. As will your peoples. We're almost finished, Code Talker. Each in our own way. My only regret will be not finishing you. There's nothing stopping you. I'm only alive because you want me that way. Ridiculous. As you wish. My regret is this misunderstanding between us. You and I, our goal is the same. We should be working together. A symbiosis. You do not know my mind. I simply want the Dine bloodline to endure. <laughs> really now? You're just another moat in the storm. How you react to all the slings and arrows, that's what counts. That's why you call those squirming monsters your children. What I have done is forbidden. Forgive me, all of you. The world should be left the way it is. You of all men should know that. Forgive me, but my schedule has changed. The time for grace and good manners has now run out. Please. Torture will not work on me. Surely you know this. Oh, I have no intention of getting rough with you. You haven't been beaten. Your hands aren't even tied. Just like me, you live in symbiosis with countless parasites. What wounds I might inflict, they'll patch right up. You might feel considerable pain, but I've no doubt you can withstand it. Then what do you plan on doing? I have a soldier standing outside. Nothing special about him, except that he always obeys. I have given him one instruction. Whenever I ring this bell, he passes on a message for me. That message is simply, go. What is this? After that, though, it gets complicated. The message will arrive at a room. 
A little bigger than this one, nothing special. Some of your people are in this room, surrounded by my men. Enough of this. They pick them at random. No regard for age, gender. In that, I suppose, they're different from you. Not as discriminating. They tied them up, one by one, blindfolded them. We had to maintain order, you understand? You bastard. Go. When they hear that, my men will pick one of your people and infect them with a parasite. Your parasite. It won't work on my people. True. The vocal cord parasite doesn't respond to your language. But what about English? An English strain. It exists. A ring of this bell, and they infect one person. If that person abandons the Navajo language, the English strain will trigger symptoms. You monster! So, it's quite simple. Every time I ring the bell, another of your people is infected. Don't do this! I don't want to do this. I'd rather not have to ring the bell. Which is why I'm hoping you will talk to me. What do you want? What else could you possibly want? You know the answer to that. How to prevent the symptoms caused by the parasite. You cannot control it like some slave. Forget the idea. Forget it? Unlikely. I will never tell you. What have you done? You made me do that. You black-hearted... Settle down. Don't use it again. Well, that is up to you. All you need to do is tell me what I want. How to prevent the vocal cord parasite symptoms. Why? Why do you need to know? The adult soldiers at Bwalayamasa are all dead. What? The parasite traveled downstream. How? It would appear that he was involved. Another demon who woke up from nine years of slumber. As a result, the vocal cord parasite spread through the village. I told you this would happen. It was an unfortunate accident. He is becoming an annoyance. He may stumble upon the truth sooner or later, but I suppose that is really of no consequence. One day, he too will pay for what he has done. Black Anna. The real demon is you. You know, this incident made me realize something. You are right. I should have acted with more humility. These creatures cannot be controlled. All the more reason I require a means to stop them. There is no such way. Oh, really? Wait! Don't ring it again. It is up to you. <sighs> Out with it! I see now. There must be more to it than that. What? They are in you. You use this land to breed more of my children. And not just here. No. In pursuit of your ethnic cleansers, you sifted through many language strains, finding hosts, breeding more and more. You would have been infected in the process, infected with countless strains. <sighs> Most likely your mother tongues as well. Romania, Northern Transylvania. You found that one too. Yes, the Hungarian strain that responds to the CK's dialect. Silence! Black Anna. It is you who shall pay. <laughs> <laughs> Is this your retaliation, old man? Let my people go, and never bother them again!
You heard me. What now? <laughs> what? No! What are you doing? <laughs> I am not afraid. I probably have every language strain inside of me. Meaning all the world's languages are already lost to me. But that suits me fine. If need be, I myself can produce whatever strain is needed. And that means nothing to you. If you are infected, you can never again speak your mother tongue. Otherwise you will die. As will every one of your countrymen. A few words here and there won't trigger the symptoms. And besides, the time is not yet right to show this face in my homeland. Not until my revenge is complete. Now... Stop! We are out of time. I have to get going. <sighs> well... No! Uh... Radiation. It's radiation. Radiation? Of course. So it can be used. But how much? I do not know. Radiation denatures their reproductive cells, preventing them from mating. Same principle as the sterilization technique. The reproductive cells are more sensitive to radiation than the rest of the body. But I have not tested it. There is no telling what mutation could result, or how the host may be affected. Not to mention what could happen if this is done post-infection. I don't care. This plan goes into action now. As long as it works, the details can wait. You wouldn't be lying to me, of course, old man. I can guarantee nothing. I owe you my life. My body has been burned on countless occasions, but it survives, thanks to your children. That is why I trust you. Then do not repeat my mistake. What's that? In the West, it is said that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the East, it is said the man of flesh brings spiritual power to words. The people knew back then that these creatures carry the gospel. They do not belong in our hands. They must not be touched. <laughs> How enlightening. I'll remember that. Consider this my thanks. What are you catch? <laughs> no! Well then, I'm afraid it really is goodbye this time, Code Talker. <sighs> huh? There. There is no soldier. Huh. Now where did he run off to? Huh? Guess he wasn't as obedient as I thought. There never was any soldier. So long. You! How dare you! Skullface. Real name unknown. Born in Hungary. More specifically, northern Transylvania after it reverted to Hungary from Romania. While he was young, the country allied with Germany as part of the Axis powers, but later during the war, it came under Soviet occupation. The Hungarians struggled for independence, but the Soviets came down. Hard. Just like he said, time and again the country was ruled by a foreign tongue. When he was a young boy, he lost his native language. The bedrock for any developing child. His country, 
His family, his face, his identity, everything was stolen from him. All he had left was his skull. Skullface first tried his hand at espionage during all the chaos from the war. Agents, military officials, and soldiers who operated out of Hungary during the war vanished over the course of several months. This Soviet spy hunt rocked the counter-intel world. Mysterious fatal illnesses, accidental deaths, drownings, people having strokes behind closed doors. Just like Stalin, no one knew who was behind it. But all you need to do was look for who had the motive. They were all taken out by a man without a face. And now we've got an idea of how he did it too. He got revenge for his people, but he wasn't finished. Skullface defected to the West, eventually ended up with the SAS. That's where he met Zero. It's possible he began planning this whole thing back then. It's hard to say. In any case, Zero made him his XO. He always did have a thing for oddballs. But this one was set to lead a unit no one else would know about. When Zero created Fox, he also formed XOF as a support team. An unconventional special forces unit designed to support Fox, make it stronger. With Skullface given the orders. Zero never even told the boss about it. Nor the CIA, naturally. If Fox was Zero's silver bullet, XOF was the recoil when he pulled the trigger. Just like Newton's third law. While you were with Fox, Skullface was operating behind the scenes. Sometimes as your backup, sometimes as a mole or a scout, sometimes as your cleanup crew. Fox's tail, making sure the mission succeeded and that you survived. We only have his word to go on, but Skullface's goal was revenge against those who'd use language to subjugate people. Those corrupting a people's identity by forcing a new tongue on them. Those using the power of language to control information. Naturally, that set his sights on Zero. To Zero, English was simply the most convenient code. But to Skullface, English was a parasite. And by eradicating it, he'd stop the world from being eaten away. If that didn't work, he was ready to see the world scorched by nuclear fire. To save language, culture, and race from annihilation, he was willing to overstep the hands of the Doomsday Clock. That is, of course, if you believe anything he had to say. Boss, we gave Ralph, that kid who died in the accident, a burial at sea. The man in charge of that facility has been severely punished. But ever since, the kids have been acting strange. It's obvious they've lost their trust in adults. I was getting reports of them ignoring the staff, or getting insolent, and even violent. And a few days later, several of the kids did a disappearing act. They snuck into choppers and shipping containers and got off base. Why? Your guess is as good as mine. These kids were born in a war zone, and forced to grow up as war fighters. If they're left alone, war is how they'll die. But I thought we showed them there are other reasons to live. I never liked having children on Mother Base. But the thought of them going back to the battlefield and picking up their old lifestyle is something I can't stomach. It makes me think of Chico, nine years ago. We have to get those kids back. Hell, they know too much about our operation. <sighs> I never expected even the kids to betray us. Snake, you remember the White Mamba? Of course, he's been going by Eli since we brought him on base. He was the leader of the child soldier unit we took out of that village and into our protection. Well, according to the kids you brought back here, all the escapees were especially close to Eli. There's reason to suspect he's behind all six escapes. We've already detained him. I'll be questioning him shortly. Wait, wait. You'll be? Ocelot. You're incapable of taking an impartial stance with those kids. Question them all you want. It'll get you nowhere. Ocelot, you get too many kicks from your art of interrogation. It's not a matter of art. 
It's about quick, minimal strokes of psychological warfare. That's what gets the answers. And it's the best way to keep both questioner and subject safe. The risks only increase the more an interrogation drags on. At that point, it causes as much pain to the inflictor as the inflicted. Huh. Like I said, too many kicks. <sighs> what I'm trying to tell you is we need quick results. Otherwise, it'll be too little, too late. I know that. And besides, I know this subject. I won't go overboard with a kid. Forget it. You're not needed. Snake, I we'll want to question the other kids too. Be sure to bring them all back. Snake, about the escaped children. Eli confessed. The way he tells it, they wanted to go back to the battlefield. Don't rob them of their freedom, he said. If you bring them all back, there will be consequences. <sighs> Next to be asking for our surrender. Consequences? What consequences? No idea. That's all I have for now. You're too attached to those kids. Stop protecting Eli. Listen to yourself. Let me question him, and we'll get some real answers. Not necessary. I'll report as and when. Boss, we found weapons in the children's section of the living quarters. As you know, weapons are strictly off limits. We've got some rule breakers. The weapons we found were handmade. Blades ground out of knives and forks, a couple of bow guns built out of scrap, and explosives made using detergents. And get this, the explosives were tightly packed with nails. The kids put the blame on, you guessed it, Eli. I guess that's what he meant by consequences. I questioned him about it, but this time he claimed they want to be put out on missions. Send us to the battlefield, he says. Miller, enough is enough. You've protected him too much already. It's my turn to question him. Protected? What Eli's doing is issuing a threat. Comply with my demands or I'll respond with force. But it'll be war at this rate. Forks and soap aren't gonna kill us, but some of them will end up dead. Is that what you want? <sighs> now, I hate to say it, but they want to be on the battlefield. It's time you gave up this fantasy. Eli, he said they'd rise up against us if we bring the last kid back. There, you see? Ignore his demands. Don't let him return to quarters. That attitude is contagious. We lose control over them for good. For the time being, we've confiscated those handmade weapons. We're bumping up security and the number of psychiatric counselors. As for Eli... He needs some very special care. You mean solitary? Well, we can't leave him in contact with the other kids. If you won't do it, I will. Boss, keep working on extracting those kids. The kids you brought back to base have laid out the situation. They all escaped to each of their home villages, or were trying to get home, and lost their way. Not that homesickness is gonna explain everything we've seen. Each of their home villages? They were trying to raise troops for the rebellion. You really think these kids have an armed uprising in them? You read the report of the security team member who had a rock thrown at him. There'll be a riot if we don't do something. And Miller, this is because you didn't act fast enough. Fine. I'll admit you were right this time. <sighs> Seal off the kids' quarters from outside contact before it's too late. All right. Eli said his rebellion would start when the last kid is brought back, right? You better be ready to meet him head on if it really happens. Yeah. You should have left it to me in the first place. Boss, they're just kid... We have a responsibility to see that those kids make it. It's not about feeling protective or the pros and cons. I hate kids. That's exactly what I heard from the people who raised me. People who abandoned me, more like. That's the spark that kept me going, you know? I wanted to show those adults what I was made of. Wanted to get back at them one day. But before I knew it, I was all grown up. Never saw it coming. All of a sudden, people treated me as an adult. 
some adult I turned out to be. But I feel like if my life had been different, if the adults I knew had been different, I could have grown up better. Yeah, that's it, all right. I wanted to use those kids to test that theory. That's all this was. From their point of view, I'm no different from the assholes who gave me a hard time. When this is all blown over, I'll talk it out with them. If that's still possible. Boss, there are still kids out there. Bring them back safe. Boss, it's me. Eli's revealed what he wants. He wants to speak with you. With Big Boss. He just said, bring my father here. Eli's too smart for his own good. No way to tell what he's thinking. All we know for sure is his men are important to him. That means we can use the escaped kids as leverage in any negotiation. Once you've brought the last one back, I'll interrogate him. If the kids do rise up, we'll meet them full force. End of story. I didn't want things to turn out like this. We could have prevented it, but it's too late now. If Eli means to take this all the way, he's gonna force us to do the same. Boss, go get that last kid. You know, when you brought back all the child soldiers who escaped, Eli knew they'd returned. Needless to say, nobody said a word to him. I guess they got a message to him somehow. Eli wasn't put in the corner in time out. He was locked up in that room, completely cut off from the outside world. Then how do you find out? It's only one possibility I can think of. The Soviet Union has been researching military applications for psi phenomena. Psi? Things like psychokinesis and ESP. Extrasensory perception. You mean moving objects without touching them? Knowing what card somebody's holding up? Psychic powers? Come on. I thought that was just another bunch of disinformation aimed at the West. Just bear with me a second. One type of ESP is telepathy. It's the ability to know another person's thoughts through nonverbal means. You're saying Eli read our minds? It's the only idea that doesn't involve someone getting to him. <sighs> Ocelot. Look, Psy research isn't some hocus-pocus. It's all evidence-based, scientific... There's gotta be another explanation. Maybe one of the kids stuck a note to your back. I hope that's the case. But I am convinced that they have, or Eli has, a connection to some force we have yet to identify. You better watch yourself, boss. How am I supposed to do that? If he is depending on something for help, well, that's his Achilles heel. If you can figure out what that something is, you might be able to use it against him. I'll keep that in mind. Oh, and the medical team is looking after the kids left on Mother Base. For the moment, they don't seem too panicked. But boss, get this. Eli got those kids to plot their armed uprising as a diversion. Also, he could steal Sahalanthropus and escape. That brat got us good. Set us up and knocked us down. And then there's that mystery kid who was with Eli. With those two working together, I'd say things won't be over for a long time yet. We finished decoding the informant's report. That floating kid we've run into a few times now. Looks like he was a test subject in clinical experiments. The Soviets called him the third boy. The third boy was brought to a lab on the outskirts of Moscow from Czechoslovakia, after which he was due to be sent to a research center in Leningrad, then Siberia, and finally an academic town in Novosibirsk. It doesn't appear that the researchers witnessed the talents we've seen from him, but nevertheless, he was quite the popular subject. His latent cognitive abilities suddenly awoke en route to Moscow. According to the report, the third boy was easily influenced by other individuals' biofields. Evil thoughts, in particular. They affected his mind like a virus. Extreme anger or resentment, motives for revenge, in other words. Now, during the transport flight to Moscow, the boy was exposed to a powerful mental energy field coming from a certain individual. Ever since, being conscious of his powers, he's become a sort of energy generator. What's unique about him is the way his acute telepathic abilities get taken over by another person's will. The boy began to physically parasitize individuals experiencing extreme anger and codify the host's desires. This includes amplifying the host's natural strengths. Or, in accordance with the host's desires, he can also implant program code in another individual, making them a puppet, essentially. 
Human neural synapses transmit weak electrical currents between neurons. These electrical currents, though at a level difficult to observe, warp the magnetic field outside the body. The third boy is able to pick up these weak fluctuations. Contrary to psychotronics, which involves controlling the human mind, his abilities as a receptor are too high. The emotions he picks up from another individual are amplified and unleashed into his body as they recur in his brain. They turn into microwaves, which then affect the physical world, triggering paranormal phenomena like the spontaneous combustion of organic matter or psychokinesis, you know, moving an object without touching it. There's one other thing. While he's parasitizing a host, the boy's ego gets shut away, allowing the will of the host to take control of his powers, like some annoying static drowning out your own voice. That means he isn't responsible for what's been happening. Somebody's extreme anger has manifested through the third boy's powers in ways none of us could have predicted, which would mean this was going on somewhere around us. Looking back on it, a lot of things make sense now. The man on fire, the Lanthropus. they both came to life thanks to the third boy's powers. Everything has been happening through him as a catalyst. We first saw him in the hospital on Cyprus. The boy parasitizing the man on fire's desire for revenge gave him his new abilities in return. He next appeared at the Hamid fighter's fort where the honeybee was hidden. There, the boy parasitized Skullface's vengeful mind. He controlled Sahalanthropus, making it do whatever Skullface wanted. Same goes for when we extracted Emmerich onto the chopper. When he appeared at the Devil's House in Central Africa, Skullface's will controlled the man on fire via the third boy's powers. Everything is clear up to this point. But even the informant couldn't pinpoint who the host was in the cave within Serac power plant. Sahalanthropus suddenly became active, then crushed not only the man on fire, but Skullface as well. Surely neither of them could have been the host. Who else was at that location and bore anger more extreme than either of them? Whose will was controlling Sahalanthropus? According to the report, emotions transmitted in children's brains affect the surrounding magnetic field more strongly. Cerebral nerves are covered with insulation called myelin sheaths to increase impulse speed. The reason for this leakage has to do with the fact that children's myelin sheaths are still developing. So, how many children do you remember being there? Children with a burning desire for revenge and bearing a grudge against you. I can think of only one, Eli. We don't know what kind of life he's had, but the resentment he's shown toward adults is nothing short of extraordinary. The third boy resonated with Eli's mind. And that means Eli bore the strongest animosity of all individuals within the boy's reception range, estimated to be a three-mile radius, beating out even Volgan and Skullface. The third boy has probably remained hooked on Eli's anger since. You remember at the Devil's House, the third boy showed an interest in Shabani? That must have been his ego making a rare appearance. He may possess abilities far beyond anyone else in the world, but he's still a kid. Maybe them both being kids was enough to bring them together. And if so, maybe with Eli, he isn't feeding off him, but acting in symbiosis with him. So what kick-started the third boy's powers? If we look at the location and time that his plane went down, we can make a pretty good guess. When the plane experienced the first anomaly, it gave an accurate report of its position to a control tower, due north of the Black Sea, 125 miles east of Kiev. Dead south on the Black Sea is Cyprus's Green Line. So the plane's position was directly north of the hospital where you'd been asleep for nine years. And this anomaly was reported at exactly the same time that you woke up. The plane was enveloped in flame from the inside out. The fuselage burnt to ashes. There were no survivors, at least not publicly admitted. Your thoughts formed a synchronicity with the boy's psyche and were amplified inside his brain. That would have been more than enough to trigger his abilities. Your rage was like a big bang in his head, blowing the lid off his powers. 
The boy was then secretly moved to the lab outside of Moscow where Volgan was comatose. There, Volgan's thoughts resonated with the boy and he was awakened. Volgan became the man on fire, hell-bent on getting revenge on you. His instincts led him straight to you. Skullface knew Volgan from Operation Snake Eater, or perhaps from even before. Monitoring this pair of extraordinaries, he discovered the hospital and sent his assassin and XOF. Skullface was probably watching the situation from close by. Then, realizing how useful these two test subjects could be, he approached them. Reacting to Skullface's thirst for revenge, this time the boy let Skullface's will control Volgan. Volgan, at times driven by personal revenge, at times through Skullface's will, kept on moving, though his body was little more than dead meat. Perhaps there were moments where even your thoughts affected him as well. But without the boy's power, it was like the plug had been pulled from the socket. Everything was powered by anger, malice, revenge. This is how the end of the report sums things up. Both the third boy and the man on fire were originally test subjects of paranormal research for military applications. Like telekinetically controlling the leader of an enemy nation and making him launch a nuke. Or stopping the heart of someone on the wrong side of the Berlin Wall. Experimenting with latent human abilities. They were used as tools of the Cold War. The boy's only crime was being born with unique gifts but he was sacrificed on the altar of war. His life reduced to slavery under other people's wills, turned into a living weapon with no will of his own. And eventually the only emotion he could feel must have been the desire to get revenge for the hand he'd been dealt. Boss, it's you that awakened the boy's powers, but there's more to it than that. I guess the anger emanating from you was something he could truly relate to. There's going to be a kind of festival held on Mother Base. They are calling it Peace Day. Snake and his men may be without a nation, but they are still an army. And that means sometimes they have to fight the bad guys. Of course, they should not fight at all. It is obvious to me that any problem can be solved with reasonable discussion. Maybe Snake and the others think so too, because the idea is to set aside war for one day a year and relax in peace. I do not know how it came about, but apparently Snake and Miller got the idea while they were talking, and everyone on Mother Base went along with it. To think that deep down they all share a love of peace, that makes me happy. But never mind that. Somehow I have ended up singing on stage. Miller was all, come on, both our names mean peace. It will be great. Why does that mean we have to be in a band? Then he roped Professor Galvez in too, saying, hey, Galvez comes from peace too. We are the perfect act. I am not sure Miller really understands the origins of the name Galvez. But then again, you always have to take Miller's talk with a grain of salt. What I cannot believe is, he went and told everyone we'd be performing together without even asking my opinion. Now everyone thinks it is all being decided. I like to sing. But I have never had to perform in front of a crowd. I do not think I'm up to this. But everyone seems to be looking forward to it. I guess I would hate to let them down. And anything is better than letting Miller sing. <laughs> oh, that was mean. Miller said he was going to write a song for us. I wonder what it will be like. It is funny. The more nervous I get, the more I find myself looking forward to it. The whole base is busy getting ready for Peace Day. Miller has finished writing his song, so I went with Professor Galvez to listen to it. Miller was really into it, humming away as he played the song on his acoustic guitar. But the song melody did not match up with the guitar chords at all, and it sounded more like a mess than music. Miller's very enthusiastic, but I think he's tone deaf. I guess the guitar backing sounded good at least. But as I was wondering how to break it to Miller, Professor Galvez took out an odd instrument. It was just two antennas sticking out of a box, more like a radio than a musical instrument. He said it was invented by the Soviets, 
But why would Professor Galvez own a Soviet Russian instrument? I asked him, and he told me music has no borders. Well, I cannot argue with that. Good music is something people of any nation can appreciate. Why not abandon war and just make music together? But anyway, the professor offered to try playing the melody on his instrument in time with Miller's guitar. It was like something from another world. But somehow, it fit Miller's guitar backing really well. It even gave the song a charming down-home kind of feeling. Miller was overjoyed. That is it. That is my melody right there, he said. It sounded totally different from when he sang it. But hearing the professor's version, I thought I could probably sing it. Then Miller hit me with the next bombshell. Buzz, you write the lyrics. I did not know whether to scream or to run out of the room. There was only one week left until peace day. So, as if putting me on stage to sing was not enough, Miller even expected me to write the lyrics. He even said he had thought of the title already. Love Deterrence. As if he had done the hard part. Deterrence? Love Deterrence? Deterrence is... It is when nuclear weapons prevent war, right? I do not see how love fits in. But it was too late to complain, so I just sat and listened to the tape of Miller's backing guitar and the professor's melody over and over again. I guess the melody is more Professor Galvez's creation than Miller's, but on the whole, I think it is actually a good song. First, it goes for your heart with a sorrowful opening, but then you feel revitalized as the song goes on. Miller grew up in post-war Japan. Maybe that is why the song has that kind of balance. Long ago, I heard some Japanese music called Enka, I think. It sounded this way. But I wonder why it has to sound sad in the first place. Miller called it Love Deterrence. Doesn't that mean he had a love song in mind? All I see of Miller and women is the way he fools around with a lot of them at once. But maybe he has had his heart broken too. And what about me? I found myself thinking about Chico and Snake as well. I know Chico has a crush on me. So naturally he should come to mind. But why Snake? He saved me, and I feel indebted to him. But I thought that was all he meant to me. Why does my heart flutter when I think of him? It is embarrassing to be unable to control this emotion. There has to be a way to suppress it, to forget it. But maybe that is what love deterrence is? With that thought in mind, I went to my desk and began to write and write. Just three days left until peace day. I have spoken enough. Your men can take it from here. Will you permit me to rest? Have something to eat? I thought you don't eat. I can subsist without food. But there is more to the act of eating than nourishment. We receive nature's blessings and reaffirm our part in it. And in doing so, we express our gratitude. <laughs> Sorry, it's, um, hearing you say you don't need to eat and that you're a part of nature in the same breath. Anyway, uh, what can we get you? Not exactly a five-star restaurant, but the kitchen's used to serving a lot of different appetites. Hamburgers. Uh, hamburgers? Even we dinner have become Americanized. I eat them often back home. <laughs> and you just can't let them go. Well, as far as symbols of the American Empire go, hamburgers are pretty good. The victory of capitalism. Hmm. Your people suffered so much at the hands of America. And you asked for hamburgers. We have suffered more than you can know. But I do not see hamburgers as an accomplice. A single dish providing a balanced helping of nature's blessings. Meat, grain, and vegetable. How could anyone hate such a magnificent thing? 
says the guy who can survive on photosynthesis. Balance has nothing to do with it. You just like a good burger. That is also true. Be warned, though. I have very high standards. <sighs> Don't worry. I do, too. All right, then. One good old-fashioned all-American icon coming up. <laughs> I look forward to it. I hope you bought a better hamburger this time, Kazuhira. Right. Well, the last one was lacking in every way. The patty was too thin, the bun too dry, and the lettuce... days old at best. <laughs> hey, that was a hundred percent all beef patty, and no shortening in the bun either. Mm. Nature's blessings. Unadulterated, in hamburger form. Is that it? But when taste falls short, so does our gratitude to nature. Making such precious blessings unpalatable is sacrilege. I... I hate to admit it, but... I think you're right. I should have known better than to settle for second best. That's why I had him run some more R&D, develop a new burger. In fact, one of our researchers just dropped by with the latest results. Here it is. See how you like this. We shall see indeed. I thank you for this bounty, Mother Earth. So? What's the verdict? Mm, not bad. Uh, and? But it does not hold a candle to what I ate back home. Uh, everyone's a critic. <sighs> Damn it. I was sure the Kobe beef... But maybe we didn't have enough. <sighs> we had any more. We're cutting into our profits. Profits? We'll be taking a loss on every unit. Hmm. What are you talking about? Huh? Oh, uh... Anyway, I'll be back with another round of product. I will be waiting. Did you say... product? <laughs>